You have Francesca Anise, who uh, that played his mother. She played his mother, Jessica. Mm, beautiful. Very beautiful. Uh, you had Brad Dourif. Is that daddy? No. No, but... <laughs> God. <laughs> I think Brad Durf would enjoy you calling him daddy, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Critical Breakdown, the podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and work our way to 100% fresh. I'm Scott. And I'm Max, and today we're talking about Dune, rated 57% on Rotten Tomatoes, and we're joined by Taylor Phillips. Hey, everybody. Returning guest, Taylor Phillips. Up, third Tay-Tay? time, third time returning guest, oh, Taylor third-timer. Phillips. We got a little X-Men special episode, we got a little Charlie St. Cloud, now Dune. Yeah. <laughs> Come just, full circle. I'm just full now circle. remembering how much I love Charlie St. Cloud. <laughs> I loved that movie. It's, I I ended up thoroughly enjoying yeah, that movie. I can't lie, I kind of like it. I I shouldn't <laughs> like it. It's not it to me it's like fever pitch where there's nothing good but it works. Yeah. So <laughs> But there's good. Zac there's Efron's good. good. Yeah, Amanda Crew. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in that it's, crew crew. It's better than Dune. Yeah, I said it. It's ugh. I said well, it. Well, you David a, Lynch fans out there. It has a uh, beginning, a, middle and an end. <laughs> so yeah. It definitely it's is. At, it's at least tied with Dune, in my opinion. I mean, the, the only thing that Duke that Dune is very much lacking is Tink Getaway. So that's true. Yeah, Tink Getaway. Man, that is a bringer back right there. That that's a hell of a bringer back. <laughs> well, let's save those Dune thoughts and let's keep thinking Tink Getaway, and let's think <laughs> about what we've been watching. Uh, Taylor, what have you been watching these days? Who um, I've been watching a lot of Rick and Morty, mm, which love I, it. which I I love. It's very good. Did you watch I that just, first episode of season three? Oh, absolutely! I've watched yeah. it like I don't know four or five times now. Yeah, it's good mm. shit. Nice. I, it really is, and I did not think I was going to enjoy it near as much as I do. And I find myself quoting it and like laughing about it to myself all the time. And for somebody who hasn't seen it, if I'm at work or at home and i want to say something like oh it's that band tony tony tone and they're like what I'm like oh, whatever i don't know i can't explain it that's me with max trying to get max to watch it i do remember a band called tony 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 so i'd probably oh, get that joke that's but not that's what it comes it. from i, I would, would just think you're really a, creative i'd go for an uh uh eek barbara durkle i'd drop that reference <laughs> on you that's a deep cut <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rick and Morty's really good, and I'm excited for the new season coming out sometime soon. I think this summer, right? Yes, that's yeah. when. So did they just? That's when they originally said. Did they just release a premiere episode and then yeah. not continue? On, on April, April Fool's, Fool's Day. Day. Nice. <laughs> that's funny. With no announcement or anything, it just came on. Yeah, which is funny. amazing. Uh, uh, any movies or anything, Taylor? Uh, I'm curious um, I, as to I, what your Wonder Woman thoughts are. I absolutely loved Wonder Woman. Um, I thought it was the best comic book movie that's come out in the past few years. I was, I was hooked from start to finish in that movie, very much so. And um, I, I cannot wait to see it again, to own it on Blu-ray, whatever. I just, I was very much in love with that movie, and I'm so happy that it did so well. Yeah, I think that's kind of the consensus. Yeah, it looks like it's going to have some strong legs, too, because the uh, yeah. repeat viewings and the uh, continuous like movie viewings have been uh, pretty strong. Yeah, I think it mm-hmm. just this weekend cracked $570 million. Yeah, Its third week w- had a very small drop, which is rare. Mm-hmm. So, uh, a really good sign. And with, uh, I- with, with the upcoming Transformers The Last Night not having the best opening number for that first night, yeah. they're predicting yeah, the a song. smaller opening for it. Yet I think they may have already announced the next like set of sequels. Yeah, they've already got a couple yeah. in the pipes. They'll they'll never stop the yeah. toys. If, yeah. I mean, it's just a guaranteed moneymaker. The plot for this one sounds so ridiculous. I've dipped back into sort of intrigue because it looks. That's kind of that's kind of where I am with it. Is yeah. like I I don't care at all, but it seems so balls out insane that yeah. I kind of feel like I need to be a part of it. You almost have to appreciate 
how little regard it has for the art reality and art. Yeah, like <laughs> I am interested in seeing the. I heard there's a scene of dialogue where the aspect ratio changes about four or five times within one exchange, <laughs> and I'm interested to see that one day on YouTube. And so. you say it's not art. <laughs> That is my only concern, is that I stopped watching after the second movie, and rightfully so, but now I feel like I really want to start watching again, just to just to see, but I am in no way paying any extra money to see two more Transformers movies before I see whatever the hell this one's supposed to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss in a recommendation for the third Transformers. It brings nothing to the table. But they fucking level Chicago in the second half of that movie, and it's so stupid, but it's pretty great. <laughs> and it's the last one with Shia. I, uh, I've only seen the first one, so to see where they're at now, just in trailers, is very confusing for yeah. me. Yeah. The first one's a, a movie about like a, a plucky kid and a hot chick a and boy in his Camaro. transforming <laughs> cars. And now I see there's like Stanley Tucci plays Merlin. Spoilers. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm. it's. Uh, I I really do recommend the third one though. I had a lot of fun watching that movie, <laughs> and I shouldn't have. We could do a uh, no a Transformers no. roundtable. No. no, 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 no. <laughs> Bex, what have you been watching? Well, I've been watching Batman the animated series. Mm. Hell yeah! It's on Amazon Prime, so I've just been revisiting. It's also on uh, TV to the max, right? I don't remember. It Maybe. is. I remember. Did you just make that up? What is that? No, that's from our TV special. Max's oh, channel yeah. was TV to the Max, and mine was Scoot's TV. I forgot about. Look at me. I'm so yeah. sorry. I yeah. can't believe I, I can't believe I don't, forgot don't, that. Don't feel too bad. I didn't even remember. <laughs> yeah, he made it. <laughs> um, but no, they announced pretty recently that uh, one of my favorite animated films, which is Batman: Mask of the Phantasm, will be coming to Blu-ray and a new like print. So. Oh, God. In order to just That's incredible. dip back into the Batman world, um, I started watching some of the animated series. And it's it's probably the best like cartoon I've seen that still holds up. Oh, absolutely. It's really, really strong. Absolutely. Like that I don't know when the last time you've watched any of Superman or Justice League or Justice League Unlimited or whatever I've is I've been watching those pretty recently. Those it's interesting to see the evolution from Batman, the animated series to, you know, where they eventually took it, but that show holds up so well. The animation is great. The voice yeah. acting is really good. Like it's just, it progressively just gets better and better and better as the seasons go on. It's so, so good. And it, it's fun just to see like little references in there and then hear like Mark Hamill with that Joker voice just from the get go yeah. being yeah. amazing. So I have a question as someone totally uninitiated to this. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, what's our time period here? When did, you said it's Mask of the Phantasm? Fanta mm -hmm. Fantas Phantasm. Phantasm. Mask of the Phantasm. When did that come out originally? Uh, that came out around 94, I want to okay. say. Mm -hmm. um, the show, the animated series started, Taylor, maybe 92 or 93? Yeah, it started, maybe 91? I say it started maybe 92. 92. Yeah, around then. Early 90s was the TV show. It started... Maybe a season after the X Men animated series, sure, um, or maybe just around it at the same time. But the, uh, uh, the, the Batman X Men animated series was the springboard for all of those. All yeah. of those cartoon, those comic book cartoons was for the nineties. Sprung off the X Men, yeah, yeah. oh um, yeah. And the X Men one has aged a lot, but it's still fun in like <sighs> a a, yeah. a weird way. You've told me a little yeah. about but it, but the uh, the Batman one holds up really, really nice. And part of that is uh, it has very like well crafted scenes uh a lot of like playing with like light mm -hmm. and uh painting within the scenes um oh, it's, cool. it's really cool it's uh it's kind of a beautiful cartoon still and like the actual cell animation blends perfectly with the backgrounds which is nice yeah. so yeah i was just wondering because i feel like there's a whole subset of animated superhero movies coming out even still yeah that i totally ignore because i just assume they're not yeah, up to snuff, or they're kind of money grabs, or they're aimed for children. So I was wondering if this was one of the newer ones. Like last year, didn't the Killing Joke come out? And I know yeah. it got bad to mix reviews. Like mixed reviews yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen a couple of those newer DC properties, and I like that each one is kind of a standalone. Yeah. Um, I think they definitely get animation better than Marvel does with their sure. entertainment group. Um, absolutely. But some of those are hit or miss. 
I mean, I've seen ones that are great, and I've seen ones that are like, okay, whatever. Um, My favorite of the DC ones is um, the Flashpoint Paradox is extremely good. It's interesting and crazy, but it's really good. And um, Batman Under the Red Hood is absolutely the best one, the one. best animated one they've made so far. I think, yeah, from the recent set. That'd be yeah. like, if you want to dip in, I would go with that one. No. So. It's funny that you mentioned the Marvel animated dip because Phil Lord and Christopher Miller are working on a Spider-Man animated movie they're going to direct. Oh, are they? Yeah, and it was just announced that Mahershala Ali is going to do a voice in it. That's cool. And I believe either the main character or one of the main characters is Miles Morales. Yeah. But uh, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller have been in the news here lately, uh, very late into the filming of the Han Solo solo movie. Uh, they have been fired. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reports, and I don't know if this is confirmed, but it's pretty widespread rumors, is that Lord and Miller are very big on improvising to create uh, really good dynamic scenes and editing and stuff. And the Kazdan brothers, I believe, or two Kazdans. Father and son. It. Father and son, okay. They are very big on using the script that they wrote. Mm-hmm. And when it came down to it, Disney sided with the Kasdans, the uh, executive producers, obviously, and Lord and Miller are out. And it was just announced that Ron Howard will come in and finish it up. So, Taylor, what, what? are your thoughts on this whole uh, <laughs> Taylor, interchange? Now you get my Facebook joke, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it? I do. Did you get my Facebook comment? Because I felt really stupid when I typed it. It was funny. I wrote, um, so, so dark, the con of Han. <laughs> And I wrote Hadana on the rocks. <laughs> um, well, well <laughs> here's my thought on that. And I discussed a little bit about this um, at work, actually, uh, today or last night. I can't remember which. When you're making a Star Wars movie, you are not making your movie. Yeah. Um, J.J. Abrams was not making J.J. Abrams' Star Wars movie. He was making a movie that the company had in mind. And he may have put his little production flair on a few things and you know used his own ways to motivate the actors but he was not making his movie um ryan johnson did not make uh wait did he direct road one he directed road one. no he, um wait who was that the director of one am i stupid ryan Gareth johnson, edwards that's yeah, right. yeah ryan johnson's doing Whatever. episode eight right yeah yeah. Oh, yeah that's right they're not making their own movies you're making the movie because i mean that movie made all of the money on the planet <laughs> and you're not they're not just going to give it to to these guys and yeah you know do whatever you want that's fine they're it's it's like when the company gives you a nice company car it's your car to use and drive and it's not your car done with but it's not your car Mm -hmm. actually is the company car i have an interesting analogy here actually i'm realizing i just read an interview with edgar wright about ant-man he talks Mm -hmm. a lot about ant-man which very similarly he was involved in for years and then creative differences pulled him out that one hadn't started shooting but he said that the relationship with marvel who is disney as well was he, edgar wright wanted to make a marvel movie but marvel did not want to make an edgar wright movie mm. and that's, that's kind of what true. it sounds like here yeah disney wants does not want to make a phil lord and christopher miller movie they want to make a star wars movie yeah what i think is really interesting is ron howard tonally is not close to those guys. Like those guys are comedic actors and yeah. they're or they're comedic directors and they're very good. I love pretty much everything they've been involved with. So this will be interesting. They did a really interesting master class with like uh, some group in London. But if you watch it, it's like two hours of them giving a PowerPoint presentation, and it's the funniest PowerPoint presentation <laughs> I've ever seen. But while while watching it at the time, I remember thinking like, like I get it to pick for a big like a big property, but I don't get it for Star Wars or Han Solo. Sure. But I was like, There's, it'll be fresh and cool and neat. Yeah. And I mean, half the time they're talking about how they do a lot of improv. And uh, they, I think half of the presentation was improv as well. So <laughs> it, it's, there's I, your sign. Yeah, I, com- I completely get how yeah. like Kath- Kathleen Kennedy and the, uh, the Kazdans were just yeah. like, this isn't working. It just seems well, so weird to go so late into the production and make that call. There's a movie, there's a movie that Fox and Kazdan and all of them, nobody has the balls to make. And it's the real Han Solo movie. That's essentially just, uh, if you could make it like a seventies black exploitation movie, 
with <laughs> Han and uh, Lando Calrissian cruising the galaxy and just slaying hoes. I think that that movie would be absolutely incredible, but nobody would ever touch that movie. Yeah. Just like bar fights, shootouts, them picking up random alien chicks here and there. Somebody, and that's the whole movie. Somebody actually made a short concept years ago called Black Star Warrior, which was Lando in a black exploitation film. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that. It's pretty funny. It has some recognizable, like, small screen talent in it. So We'll we'll link it on the blog post. Yeah, we'll throw it up in there. <laughs> but I think that's really interesting. It's funny, because we were talking with Kara, another former guest of the pod, and I was saying how, well, Ron Howard's such a big director, I'm surprised he's not getting his own film. Then when you think about it, Ron Howard hasn't really been churning out hits for a while. Rush yeah. was very nope. good. Rush was flopped. really good. Yeah. Uh, Cinderella Man, I thought was good, but it's nothing spectacular. A Beautiful Mind was great, but A Beautiful Mind was 2001. Apollo 13 was 1995. That's a Willow long time. Willow was 1988. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was. Exactly. Well, so. he also did um, Heart of the... Was it called Heart of the Sea? Yeah, In the Heart in of the, the Sea. In, in the Heart of the Sea. Yeah. That, that one didn't do too well, did it? It did terrible. That one, well, I don't know, because he was the executive producer and everything, but it had a lot of trouble at release because they moved the release date, not like a week, but like a year. <laughs> because of Star Wars, ironically. When Star Wars uh, The Force Awakens was announced, they had to move In the Heart of the Sea to uh, try and recoup anything. What's really interesting is Ron Howard was on George Lucas's pick of his short list of directors to direct yeah. The Phantom Menace. All of his friends at the time, who were also directors, like Francis Ford Coppola, <laughs> were like, these are your movies. You you should do them. We can't take them from you. Oh, so it's even God, more interesting now to see <laughs> yeah, to see how that turned out, Full to see circle. how he sold it, and then to see how Disney slash Lucasfilm was like, let's no. get anyone. No. Can you imagine being in that group of friends and then watching episode one and then like turning to Francis Ford Coppola and punching him in the arm like, you fucking moron. You should not have said that. Like, I've made a huge mistake. What crap was. <laughs> um, what's interesting though, you mentioned Rogue One, and that one also kind of went through some really late. I don't know if it had a full director change, but Tony Gilroy came in and did some rewrites, some reshoots, and yeah. he got paid a lot of money, and he did a good job. Yeah, but I don't know. It it's interesting. Uh, you don't reshoot, see this kind of the turmoil. concept of a reshoot does not scare me. Most movies go through reshoots, but whenever you drop your directive team. Yeah. you know into production that's a that's a bfd but yeah and when you have one director in doing the initial shoots and then you're like all right new director yeah. new shoots like it'll be interesting to see how the han solo film turns out compared to like yeah. justice league where yeah. they're like 98.8 percent done versus yeah. like 95 percent done yeah so and it, the circumstances are so different too mm -hmm. um there's there's not a lot of um unrest in what yeah. Zack Snyder was doing with yeah, yeah. Justice League. So. And most people are like either like I like Zack Snyder and I feel bad for him or I don't yeah. like Zack Snyder's work but I feel bad for him. Yeah. So it's a much more supportive situation. Yeah. Well I don't think Disney comes out looking very good with this. No. But um, I think they'll yeah. wash their face tuck their I, was, I think they'll get over it. Yeah, they'll get over them and they'll yeah. yeah just wake up the next day. Okay. The Han Solo movie will make like 1.8 billion. I saw, I saw someone on Twitter was like this is going to cost Kathleen Kennedy her job. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> she she won't even remember this a year from now. She'll be too busy uh, eating lunch on her giant pile of money <laughs> yeah, to be yeah. any at all worried about that time so. she had to switch directors. You know what I like about you, Taylor? You said lunch. That? She's eating lunch <laughs> on her giant pile of money. You don't eat dinner on a pile of money, man. It's, it's unrealistic. Yeah. And breakfast, you're just waking up. You don't yeah. want to have to get traction on a pile of money. Yeah. Sleeping no. on a pile of money just isn't a good idea. No, no. It's bad for your back. Yeah. All right. So, so last week, Max challenged me to get a top five list of the movie pugs out there. This has become surprisingly relevant, and we'll show why in a little bit. But I have that top five list. Taylor, are you ready? I don't know that I am. Well, Max, are you ready? Are you starting with five and working your way towards one? Yeah, I'm gonna do five to one. Okay, I'm ready. Is All this right. the critical? Is this the critical pug breakdown that you're working on? This right is now? the critical pug breakdown. Yeah, yeah. pug yes. list five. All right, let's go. Pug list five. All right, number five is the Hobbit: The Desolation of Smog. Mm. Now, a little uh, uh, behind the curtain, there aren't many movies with pugs. Let's be real. I ruled out the Secret Life of Pets. 
and Hotel for Dogs and these movies that are about dogs and animals. A dog's purpose. I don't know if there's a plug in there, but I didn't even consider it. Desolation of Smog has one scene where five street puppy pugs run around and eat a bunch of bread on the ground. They're in the movie for about as long as Stephen Colbert was in the movie. How about that? <laughs> so that's number five. Number four, I want to come back to. Ooh. 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 Number three, Pocahontas. That's where this actually came up. Animated pug. Animated pug, but mm-hmm. a pug nonetheless. Yeah, Percy yeah. was his name. Percy the pug. He actually looks really funny in the, the animation. Him. Uh, he didn't have a uh, spoken role, so uh, I imagine an effects team voiced him. Let's go with Christian Slater. Christian Slater yeah. did the voice okay. for Percy yeah. the Pug. I like that. That's I wonder, correct. do you think Christian Slater came back for Pocahontas 2, which Percy was also in? I would hope so. Journey to the New World. Yeah. Actually, I think that is what it was called, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. There you go. Nice. That's why you're on the pub. Number one and two, though, this is why you show up. This is the pugs you show up for. Kingsman, the Secret Service. Hmm. Taylor, yes. did you see Kingsman? There's a pug yes, in the I movie poster. Yeah. Oh, it's great. And yeah. Max, I don't think, has seen it. I have it not still. seen it, but yeah. I know the movie poster. Everyone yeah. could not stop laughing at the fact that in the corner there's a pug face. That's JB, <laughs> the pug. His name is Jack Bauer. And part of the training to become a Kingsman is you have to raise a dog from puppyhood. And the uh, uh, Eggsy, the main character... Wanted to get the German Shepherd, but he didn't, and he ended up with a pug. It was like the booby prize. But he ended up really loving that pug. There's some adorable scenes with that pug. I want to watch Kingsman again now. Reading this made me yeah. want to watch it again. And as a <laughs> pug dad. <laughs> uh, for Max just pulled up the poster, and it's amazing. <laughs> it's just like you wouldn't even see it if you were just walking by. Yeah. He kind of blends in with an explosion, <laughs> and then you zoom in, and there's a pug. Number one could be none other than Frank from Men in Black. Mm. Uh, of course. I get more people calling my pug Mickey Frank. Uh, I get that a lot, and I think Mickey appreciates it. But um, he's a very satisfying pug role. And the, the reason he's number one is because he's a key character in the Men in Black, the first two. I haven't seen the third, so I actually don't know if he was in the third, but... Uh, JB was just kind of a plot point in number two. And yeah. Percy was just kind of a running gag in Pocahontas. So that's why that did, has those rankings. Did he get some credit for actually looking like your pug to you? I don't know if uh, Frank from Men in Black was given credit. Or do you mean on my list? On your list. No. Okay. Because no. he, he probably looks the most like your pug. Do you want to know how, know how iconic Frank from Men in Black is? I didn't even Google him. I knew he was number one. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. But let's but you, circle you back. S- you skipped one. I, s- I skipped one. Did you notice that too, Taylor? I, you know, I have my fingers held up right here, and I've only got four fingers held up on a list right. of five. So the number four one. movie pug of all time is in none other than Dune. No way. No way. We truly did not know this when we picked these movies. We picked these movies long ago. Yeah, I couldn't have known about the setup for the top five movie pugs, so yeah. it worked out really well. Yeah. But uh, the name of the pug is unknown. It is not considered canon to the Dune book series mm. because it's only in the movie. Yeah. But yeah, well, there, there's some Then really I won't sad... be reading the books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm scratch, out. Scratch that off my <laughs> list. Um, there's some very satisfying scenes of this humble pug mm-hmm. dutifully sitting in... Paul Atreides' lap and uh, Papa Atreides. He's like a, a lap dog, yeah. fully. Naturally. I think he only walks on the floor in maybe like one scene. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I think it was when uh, shit was going going down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But do you guys see how now we're talking about Dune? It's, uh, it's the bringer back this week. Let's, let's bring her back number two. Yeah. It is. Max, what's the plot synopsis for Dune? A duke's son leads desert warriors against the galactic emperor and his father's evil nemesis when they assassinate his father and free their desert world from the emperor's rule. A duke's son is a weird way to lead that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it's as accurate as you could be. You can maybe say like a duke's exiled son. That's about yeah. as, as more specific as you can get. Yeah. yeah. But... Yeah, uh, that's Dune. That's yeah. this movie, at least. Yeah, uh, that's the that's definitely the movie. I challenge anyone to come up with a good, concise summary for Dune. 
David they Lynch tried and two... failed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, David Lynch had two and a half hours to work with, yeah. and he couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. So why would we pick it? Uh, well, like we just said, it's David Lynch. That's one. Um, it's Dune. It's Dune, which popular is a popular book know, series. Yeah. Very famous book series. Um, and this is like a famous flop. Mm-hmm. For sure. You, uh, when you hear about like big failures in cinema, this usually gets thrown around. I believe part of the reason for that would be because David Lynch himself is very open about how big of a failure this was. Yeah. And I was reading that in some cuts of the movie, the director was credited as Alan Smithy, not mm-hmm. uh, not David Lynch, which is your classic, I don't and want a, my name on this. He's gone on the record to say the theatrical cut was his cut. Yeah. So anytime you see a director's cut, that's not him. Like this is the cut he did and he... He owns it. Yeah, sure. he owns it. He owns that it was bad. He owns that it was him selling out. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I think it's an interesting piece of cinema to witness and to like kind of savor yeah. how, how weird and faily and not good it is. Yeah. So, but at I the same some, time, I have, I have, some I have a soft spot it. for moments in this film, I'll say. Yeah. The yeah. weird whispering, um, the weird uh. like uh, narration bits. When I first saw this, I was just like, this is the weirdest movie I've ever seen. Yeah, the narration was baffling. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor, you said you had some thoughts on this, some theories. If you don't look at the movie as a sci-fi movie, if you look at it as him directing a space opera, you can sort of enjoy it a little more. See, If, I th- you, if you look at it as him directing some sort of grand play that happens to take place uh, in the universe of a fantastic science fiction novel, then you can enjoy it a little more, but at the same time, it's, there's a lot of stuff that works and a lot of stuff that absolutely does not work. Okay. There's not a lot of stuff that works. There's some (laughs) stuff that works. That makes me (laughs) wish this was a musical. A musical would make it better. Yeah. Songs in the tune of Dune. Ooh, Ooh. write it, (laughs) write it and send it to Denis Villeneuve. And Manuel Lynn Miranda. Get him in there. Yeah, sure. He's in everything. Dude, make him Paul. Oh, shit. Oh, fu- yeah. Can we work on this, guys? <laughs> All right. Thanks no. for listening. Hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if, if Lynn Miranda is going to be Paul Atreides, you know who Duke Leto Atreides is, right? I say you just roll Sting back. <laughs> Edward James Olmos <laughs> is Duke Atreides. Cool. I'd be down with that. You know I'm down with that in anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what did Dune outrank here? What didn't we pick? We had some yeah. we had some some interesting choices here. Uh, mm. I'll say the least interesting was Paper Towns. Uh, see, I'm such a sucker yeah, for good. young adult novels <laughs> and coming of age stories that I don't think that's the least interesting on this list. My uh, yeah, I I like young adult novels too. I don't like John Green slightest, so I don't like looking at him. So we're good. He makes Dude, me uncomfortable. That's why we <laughs> like Charlie St. Cloud so much. Is because we love young adult novels. But see, John Green. Yeah. He just makes me uncomfortable. My brother one time out of the blue texted me and said, John Green looks like he has a secret underage girlfriend. And I laughed about it, and it's just stuck with me for years. Um, I have i can't say I've ever seen John Green, and I've actually never read or watched any of his <laughs> novels or adaptations. <laughs> You're just going up to bat for the genre. Yeah. yeah but, like, let's not say Paper Towns is the least interesting on this list. For me, it is. Well, I'll you're say. wrong. I rank everything I'll say after this as more interesting to me. We'll see. I really need to hear the rest of the list. Number two, Free Willy. What? Whoa. A kid saves a, an orca. And Michael Was it Jackson, an orca? What? Was it an orca? Yeah, it's a killer whale, orca. Same thing. Oh, I um, didn't know that. But uh, Michael Jackson does the song. Hell yeah, he does. There's a lot of a uh, lot of talent in it. I'm gonna say, if uh, Max, if you walked in to my living room and you held up two Blu-rays, and you said, Scott, what do you want to watch? Paper Towns or Free Willy? I'm picking Paper Towns. I know you are. Yeah, I would not fucking pick Paper Towns <laughs> at all. <laughs> Next I'd be up. mad that Max asked me the question instead yeah. of just putting Free Willy. He would grab Free Willy out of my hands with much anger in his voice. <laughs> uh, next up is <laughs> Twister. This was this is an interesting one. What? Yeah. Twister, that's a good one. Taylor, you have to remember not to look at it with these rose-tinted glasses. <laughs> Dune is still the right choice because it's so weird. Yeah. But There's, Twister's kind I, of iconic. 
Yeah, let and me, I think let me make it abundantly I think, clear. I have no regrets in watching <laughs> Dune. I have no regrets, of course, about being on the pod. But we could have watched Twister and Free Willy, man. We could have had a double header and here. Paper Towns. <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> I think Twister's stock has gone up with the passing of the great Bill Paxton. Yeah. So of I think course. I think a lot of people it went from a movie they kind of remember to like a movie they love. That being said, Taylor is one of those people who love that movie from the get go. <laughs> He's an OG Twister. Yeah. I'll say this. Twister stock has gone up having seen The Day After Tomorrow. <laughs> That's true. Memory was stinky That's very garbage true. butter. Yeah. Um, speaking of a better version of a movie we watched before, Short yeah. Circuit. Is Def Patel's it? actually going to be in the remake. God, I wish. I just made that up. Short Circuit is but a good version it. of Chappie. You know, you made that joke for a long time before I ever even saw the movie. And then I saw the movie, and you're exactly right. Hell, you are I'm, exactly correct. I made that joke before I saw the movie, and I was correct. <laughs> I mean, no matter what, both Short Circuit 1 and 2 are better than De- uh, better than Chappie, because De Antwerp's yeah. not in it. So, oh, God. Dude, Chappie blows. That is, that is the most jarring part of that yeah. movie to me. Oh, is easily. Having yeah. Those two people starring as themselves in a movie, uh, it's... It, yeah. it, Ugh, God. Well, like, while I didn't like every- Yolandi, I could handle her as a bit part, but Ninja yeah. physically made me feel ill. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. he really looks like somebody who would rob a pizza delivery driver in a yeah. trailer park. Like I don't I don't trust him at all to look at him or to that being said, I love like four of their songs a lot. Uh Ninja looks like he'd be on Gady Prime in yeah. the Dune universe. Yeah, so, yeah he does. He'd be he'd be a Harkonnen. One quick thought oh, on for sure. one quick thought on Chappie. Recently, um, director Neil Blomkamp, I was reading an interview he did where he was comparing Chappie to like Blade Runner and yeah. I, uh, The Thing. He was like, there's all these misunderstood sci-fi movies like Blade Runner and Chappie. And I just wanted to attack the computer monitor I was reading it on. Chappie sucks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not <laughs> like, good. He's like, I made my vision and audiences just didn't get it. And it's like, that doesn't mean your movie's good. I hate that argument. Yeah, the, You can't just is, say... This is for the fans. Yeah, this is for the fans. It's a terrible <laughs> argument. But so is, we made a good movie, just nobody gets it. Yeah. <laughs> um, sp- and, and somebody got it in the next one. Uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. The yeah. James Bond film. I don't even know which one this is. This Michelle one, Yeo? Yeah, Michelle Yeo. Um, Yeo? The bad guy in this one is like a multimedia conglomerate. And I think he's doing something with trying to incite a war with China. Sure. This is like Clintonian 90s era. So you Mm -hmm. had to come up with like really concise threats. This is like pre huge terrorism issue. Yeah. So I want to say he he tries to, he has like a secret submarine and a weird hovercraft. Sounds like a Pierce Brosnan Bond movie. Exactly. Exactly. Paper so. Towns is more interesting than that. I disagree. This is Cara Delevingne. We don't get that. We need to watch her. We need unless to figure she's, it out. Unless she's wiggling the whole time. <laughs> no way. Yeah. W- what about her mermaid role in Pan? That's the best thing I've seen her in. This has been a very self-referential episode <laughs> yeah. of the Critical Breakdown. Taylor, uh, wh- which of those would you watch the most? You want the most to watch. How am I wording this? What, the- between Paper Towns and... Between all of them. All of the these line. films. <laughs> we, we said a lot of films in the past 30 seconds. Yeah, we did. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Look, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I don't want to watch Paper Towns, okay? <laughs> That's just... Regardless of what film I'm picking, I'm not picking that. That's good for you. So because... much for that sponsorship, Paper Towns. <laughs> <laughs> because we picked Dune. Yeah. We got to talk about Dune instead. Absolutely. That's the movie I wanted to watch. We watched it. We sure did. Well, I actually don't know if I watched it. I was there. (laughs) It happened near me. I wish you guys knew what the Scott confused face looks like because there was. Oh, man. It it jumped to that a lot. He he also jumped to the the no face, just like the mm -mm, not not feeling it. I was. I was disgusted at parts of this movie. <laughs> parts of this movie are disgusting. Oh, for sure. Let's talk like cast and stuff though, because yeah. there's like a weird amount of stars in this movie in incredibly this is, uh, small roles. 1984. Yeah. So a lot of these people had small roles because they were kind of just starting. They were just small. somewhere already established. 
Uh, this is the premiere role, like the debut of Kyle McLaughlin. Yep. Um, I don't know if it was Virginia Madsen's first role, but she's the first face you see in this film. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So this is she's now in the Pantheon. Yeah. This is her welcome. second appearance. <laughs> uh, you have Francesca Anise, who uh, that played his mother. She played his mother Jessica. Mm, beautiful. Very beautiful. Uh, you had Brad Dourif. Is that daddy? No. No, but... <laughs> God. <laughs> I think Brad Dourif would enjoy you calling him daddy, maybe. Uh, he is famous for being... <laughs> Can that be the intro to this week's episode of, of The Critical Breakdown? It's just, is that daddy? And then the music starts up right after that, please. <laughs> um, he's famous for being Wormtongue. In the uh, rings, as well as Chucky. He's Chucky in every single um, child's play and seed of Chucky, whatever movies they've done after that. The Bride of Chucky. And now uh, you you also had um, Patrick Stewart, who wasn't no. wasn't Paul's dad, but he's daddy too. Um, <laughs> when Sting stings in this movie, Sting, he ca- yeah, he wears he, he he wears metal underwear. For his daddy in the film, basically. Uh, you have Dean Stockwell. You have Max von Sydow. Sydow, have you ever said it? Yeah. Looking young. Really young. Like the youngest I've ever seen him. Yeah. Um, not it really. probably was. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen him in something before this. Yeah. But uh, you had Alicia Witt. She's a tiny baby in this movie. She's oh. like four. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And then you had Sean Young. And then uh, the actual daddy... <laughs> Was played by Jurgen Prochnow. Prochnow. Yeah, he was in something else we watched. He was in Judge Dredd. Ah, he played yes, one of the yes, bad yes. guys in Judge yeah. Dredd. So full circle. It's a huge cast. There's about fifty other names I didn't mention, and yeah. literally he was on the council in Judge Dredd, wasn't he? Yeah, yep. he was. Yep, he was so. the corrupted council member. Yeah. yeah, you know, I say that from memory because I fucking love Judge Dredd. <laughs> <laughs> that movie's pretty good. Better than, better than Dune. Better than Dune. Better than Dune. Well, we talked about how David Lynch thinks Dune's a failure. Uh, I would say audiences agreed. Mm-hmm. At the box office, Dune had no international run, which is interesting. 1984. Makes uh, sense. We've had a couple other movies with no international, but um, like uh, Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. But Dune had no international. Its total domestic gross was $30.9 million, which is pretty low especially compared to its 40 million dollar budget mm-hmm. and it opened at six million dollars number two behind beverly hills cop mm. on yeah. december 14th 1984 just imagine like 84 you want to go see the movie yeah go up to the theater this is you know pre-internet this is you you can maybe catch a, a commercial on tv yeah. but you probably saw trailers at the movie theater you see the trailer for doing you're like wow that looks really weird and then you see something like beverly hills cop so what would you pick? It, you know. I think I would pick that. Yeah, so. I'd probably be like, directed by David Lynch. That's the guy who turned down Return of the Jedi. Yeah, he did. Um, he did re- turn down Return of the Jedi, which nope. is a weird decision. But seeing this, knowing how <laughs> you know <laughs> they are with directors on Star Wars movies, yeah. I don't. Th- I don't think he would have fit. No, those Ewoks been would have been really weird. Yeah, they would have been like muscular and yeah Ugh. um yeah so this this movie's pretty wild um the first cut was i think about four hours not a theatrical cut but the yeah. first cut they they mocked up for the studios and the studio was like let's keep cutting um he did not get final cut on the film i think but okay. um so his version was never going to be seen like fully, but he does say yeah. the release version is his version. Like that's it. Yeah. He's done with this movie. He'll never revisit it because it just is too depressing for him. Yeah, I mean, there's not a storyline of well, yeah. it got messed up in the cutting room floor. Yeah, it's just it was. This is my cut. This, this is, is what I made, and it wasn't good. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of weird trivia on this film. Uh. One thing that is kind of funny is Sean Young, who played uh Paul's concubine slash girlfriend chani was her name um she uh her agent booked her to meet with uh rafaela de De laurentis and david lynch for uh, a casting session she the agent never told her so she just never went 
but then they all got stuck at the same airport and stuck like waiting for the same plane just by chance. Wow. And so David Lynch and the producer, uh, they were like, why did you ditch us? And she was like, I never did. What are you talking <laughs> about? And so then like the whole thing was cleared up. So she was almost never in the film, which really is inconsequential because <laughs> her character is yeah. just in the movie. Man, this movie would have really fallen apart without her. Yeah. yeah. Can so. you imagine if they were uh, just trying to make small talk while they were there? And Sean Young yeah. turned to uh, David Lynch, and David Lynch looks at her and says, Tell me of your home state, Sean. <laughs> and she keeps having. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, we could talk about if there's things we think that really works with this film. Um, well, that is going to have to be the show. If we talk about things that don't work in this film, this podcast can be two and a half hours long. Well, let's, just like the movie, yeah. let's start <laughs> with just like the 50,000 foot overview of the plot. You have all these galactic families. It's all coming down to the planet Arrakis, also called <laughs> Dune. Also called Dune. They say that six times yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the spice melange, mm-hmm. which is used for like space travel. It's the only place it's found. So then there's this whole espionage plot where the emperor of the entire known universe, I believe that's actually his title. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Wants to set up the... Atreides family for failure by pitting them against their already greatest rivals, the Harkonians or whatever. Harkonnens? Harkonnens. Harkonnens. So he sets up this like situation where the Harkonnens attack them and then Paul Atreides and his mom get exiled and meet some dune doonies. Some fremings. They That's, ride yes. some worms. They fight back. Mm-hmm. And in the end... We're looking at Emperor Paul Atreides. Yeah, that's that's yeah. about it, man. I mean, there's obviously a lot of meandering and details within that, and we'll talk about some of it, but that's yeah. here at the absolute highest level. Yeah, yeah, that, that's so, it. So now let's talk about what works. This will be a shorter half of that discussion, but Taylor, <laughs> what's one thing that Dune really worked for you? One level it worked on. <clears throat> well, okay. I noticed this from the beginning when I was watching the uh, the beginning credits when uh, Toto has that sweet score that's <laughs> showing one, you know, which was yeah Toto did the music for this movie. Um, uh, almost all the music. Uh, yeah, they, they did they did the whole soundtrack except Brian Eno yeah. did the theme. The theme. The prophecy theme. Mm. Their theme really resembled something else to me, and I can't figure out what it might have been. I was trying to place it the whole time, and I can never figure it out. Um, but the, there are two names that stood out to me in the credits. One was Kit West, and he did the uh, mechanical special effects. Okay. And I was like, I know that name. He worked on Young Sherlock Holmes, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Dragonheart, and Return of the Jedi. Wow. Hmm. So he has a pretty uh, pretty good resume. And the other guy was Carlo Rambaldi, and he did creature design. And he did creature design also on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Alien, E.T., the 76 version of King Kong, and then Silver Bullet. A lot of good and stuff. Silver Bullet also stars a person from this movie, uh, a guy named Everett McGill. He's one of the bearded um, Fremen that Paul encounters oh, yeah, towards yeah, the I... end, which was – he will always be the werewolf pastor from Silver Bullet to me. <laughs> well, you're kind of always. touching on, on some of the technical aspects of the movie, which – You have to take the timing with a grain of salt. It's 1984. But Mm -hmm. other than some incredibly odd decisions, the mechanical and technical aspects of it were fine. Like the the spice mills or whatever they were getting picked up by the um, ships. That was pretty cool. I thought that was cool. Uh, The worms were very cool. They gave them a very proper sense of scale in Mm -hmm. my mind. Yeah. Um, they were terrifying and they just behaved like you'd expect them to. To bounce off of this, um, for me, one thing that I really enjoyed is the strange technology. It doesn't always work, but I like that it wasn't just straight up beep, beep, boop, beep, like panels at the time. Everything else would have been, um, including Star Wars, Star Trek. So to see like weird, almost like art deco slash body technology. Like to see a mashup of something different was at least like, oh well, that's kind of cool. Some of some of the time it works. Um, yeah. When he's supposed to be like fight training and it looks like he's fighting an espresso machine, it doesn't work <laughs> as well. But it's cool to see like this is the first time a body was covered in like a computer generated effect. 
Yeah. Which mm-hmm. was the shield. Doesn't necessarily work, but that's cool in a technical way. It looked insane. Is, it, yeah. It's what got me about Kit West, him working on young Sherlock Holmes, is that that was the first movie to actually show a completely computer generated character. Hmm. So it makes sense that this was kind of a stepping off point for him. Yeah. And the, uh, I loved the set pieces in this movie. The set pieces looked huge and they looked like pretty pretty grand in my opinion the only there's a decent is, sense is, of scale for most of them yeah yeah i, I would say especially yeah. in the second half yeah like when he's going all tribal yeah yeah and like i like the uh the set pieces in um the emperor's room when they have the space navigator that comes in yeah that's and, that's a um, weird that, that was very strange it was like a giant vagina monster yeah. inside an iron <sighs> lung and railroad I think car they don't necessarily say this in the film but i think it's like a humanoid based off of a human that is like lives in spice or something. Yeah. So that like, they're the ones who fold space. Yeah. They're the controllers. Yeah. Uh, I wrote down the name of their group somewhere. It's but... like the spacing guild or something. Yeah. 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 Um, but they're gross. They're like living in this liquid. You, we, we laughed at this because, um, and I actually do like it. It's kind of like a moment of levity. They're just like his protectors or its protectors bring it into the, the emperor's throne room. And is using some weird translator and is like, we're not here. And it was just a funny moment that this <laughs> giant, like, <laughs> school bus sized alien <laughs> yeah. comes in in a giant tank with 20 dudes in trash bags and a microphone and just is like, we're not here. <laughs> You're not seeing us. The least and, covert entrance <laughs> yeah. possible. And it, it does give you at least a sense of, like, this is different. This is weird. Yeah. And if you're like us, you're like, this is funny. At that point, we're yeah. not out on the film. We got yeah. out shortly after, probably. But... Yeah, it didn't take much. But at this uh, point, now, it's like, uh, if this is a tongue-in-cheek film, I think that line would have been like delivered very well and gone very far in the movie. Yeah, This is not a tongue-in-cheek no. film, though. What, what I, wrote, I wrote down that the style of this movie is Terry Gilliam meets Tim Burton. <laughs> that Ugh. gothic style of uh, Tim Burton with that like long, far away... Uh, sort of matte painting crazy look of Terry Gilliam, like his sci-fi stuff. Yeah, there's definitely influence there, similarity at least. I mean, David Lynch is, I mean, he's a major director, Yeah. right? I mean, Twin Peaks is probably his biggest thing, especially because that revival is going on now, but Mahone Drive. He's done uh, one of my favorite films, The Elephant Man. The Elephant yeah. Man is iconic. Uh, Lost Highway, a lot of people love. So he clearly has a vision and he knows how to do stuff like this. I just don't know what happened here. Because a lot of the craft of the film I found just very muddy at times. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. While we're sticking with the positive, though, the set piece of the Atreides family folding through space, I thought was actually kind of cool. Yeah. They show up at this big, like, train station, basically, where everyone's waiting to get folded, and Paul is in wonder, and so is his pug in his lap. <laughs> and the whole family's, like, a little nervous about it because it's definitely a foreign thing. And they do this weird stuff where it's like a PowerPoint filter almost, like those screen wipes <laughs> of a PowerPoint. Yeah. Like circling, and they show the vagina monsters like folding it around. But some of the stuff they did, like the horizon and the colors, was actually pretty cool. It was kind yeah. of an enthralling scene. You got to think before before CG was what it is now, yeah. you have to make these things look cool. You have to make them look different. Yeah. And I think they did a good job with that. And they, like you said, they did inventive things. They tried yeah. to make it cool yeah. and different. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't go I, the safe route at any point. No. I really love, like the uh, shot when the navigator enters the emperor's room. It was a handheld shot because I rewound it and watched it again. Uh, it's just they open those big doors and that school bus <laughs> smoke filled train car <laughs> comes in and it just backs up in perfect. Like, and as it backs up, you really get the size of the room and how big the, uh, you know, whatever the hell that thing is yeah. Yeah. before they open it up. And I liked that shot quite a bit. And there's a few other random shots here and there where I'm like, that's just really cool. It's that shot is really good, but and, it doesn't uh, jumping off. It that, doesn't save anything. I, I wasn't crazy about how the ships themselves looked in the movie. Yeah. But yeah. once the ships land and it looks like it's like landing gear and you realize that's a giant column and like these tiny people are coming out of it. I like the sense of scale on the ships. Mm-hmm. They're oh, yeah. freaking huge. They they did a terrible job showing how big they were though when they were showing the dialogue within the ships. Yeah, it's like a tiny They show cockpit. a tiny <laughs> cockpit that looks like it seats four. It was yeah. like a Camry. And then when they zoom out to outside, it is a massive ship. Yeah. Like one of the set pieces, they were going to one of those spice crawlers and saving the people because it was getting it was about to get hit by a worm. Yeah. And they were saving folks and like two guys get in the cockpit 
And I was like, that's it? And then it turns out there was like eight other people on that ship because yeah. it's a much bigger ship than it yeah. looks. Um, yeah, that's, they ask him how many people are inside the crawler, and he says 23. Yeah. And he was like, well, bring them aboard. Damn the spice. And I was like, 23 people are – there's going to be some people yeah. sitting on laps in there. Like, that's yeah. not going to yeah. fit. <laughs> You're, I mean, well, you're right. <laughs> that's a good, a good way to pivot into things that didn't work for us. So there's yeah. some continuity – definitely there with with things like that that's like a minor gripe i think in the overall yeah. picture there's yeah. moments where they're like re- referring to groups of, of people and there's tons of people yeah. is what they're referring to but you only see like 20 at any given time yeah. so while the scale is good in the sense like the sets have good sense of scale with the people it's back and forth i mean they'll have wars Ugh. where you see 30 people fighting and that's yeah. like both sides yeah so that kind of bugged me because i never really felt in it there might be one scene where there's a bunch of people marching, but I think they might have blew their people marching budget on that scene. So they, I think they did a really because that's world building, yeah, is what that is. And they also did a bad job of the character development because oh yeah yeah you don't for pretty they much anybody any. you don't get why anything's happening. Like Paul is having this; he's the main character, Paul Atreides. He's having this coming of age kind of. He's learning. He's the hero. He's learning. He's there. <laughs> yeah. So then there, there's this whole plotline where he's like the only male who can drink the whatever. It's like the water. The water of life. Water, water of life. life. Yeah. That's it. And it doesn't really develop. They sort of plant the seed at the start with those weird, um, like nuns. Benny Jesuit. Or yeah. Something? Benny the Jesuits. Benny Jesuits. Yeah. Kept, Benny Jesuit. Yeah. They kept yeah. mentioning this stuff, and none of it connects because yeah. it just doesn't get there. Yeah. It kind of falls into. Uh, both the Golden Compass and the other one we watched with Lily Collins. Oh, the, the Mortal Instruments. The Mortal Instruments. You can Ugh. tell there's a rich source material. You yeah. can tell there's some interesting stuff coming from it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't grow into anything. Yeah. It's just, it just falls flat most of the time. Yeah, like they talk about the spice melange being this like limitless drug. And occasionally, like when Paul gets his first whiff of it, he's like, so this is the spice they yeah. speak. <laughs> but then, like, I don't, it. I don't feel like that delivered anything, though. No. Like at the end, it wasn't like he was like all spiced up. Yeah. You know, he was just him. like at one point. I think they were trying to hint at something with the worms because he was like, "The worm smells of spice," <laughs> but like they didn't like do anything with yeah. it. It's just kind of there, and the whole idea, the the whole plot hinges on. Paul, who now is Moadib, uh, oh, joining the Fremen, <laughs> and then using the worms to both get rid of the Harkonnens and get revenge, shut down spice production, therefore making the Emperor have to show up, and then destroying Gain the Emperor. Of it. And yeah. they were doing a jihad the whole time, is what they kept saying. So, actually, that's one thing I do like with the world building, is like there's a lot of concepts from our planet worked in, yeah. like religiously, but they barely get into that. So, I would have much more liked to see that kind of stuff developed. Um, yeah, I did think it was really cool that they kept mentioning religion and stuff, even yeah. though the religion in this didn't make any sense. Yeah, I'm pretty the, sure it's supposed to be a combined religion of like every religion, because yeah. this is like the year 10,000, by the way. Yeah. Um, 10,491. So, like, so everything, yeah. everything's different. Then halfway through the movie, they just jump to the year 10,493. Yeah. At one point in the movie, out of nowhere, the narrator, narrator's just like, and two years later, it continued. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's no way, if if you missed that literal one line, there's no way to know yeah. that literally years have passed because yeah. none of the characters look different or anything. Except there's the thing with the blue eyes, I guess, like the exposure to the, the spice gives the, what was it, the, the Freons? The Fremen. The Fremen. The Fremen. <laughs> they, they give the Fremen's blue eyes and Paul's eyes started getting there too. Yeah. What? Blue within blue. How did the Fremens like exist though? Like that, that I don't even get. Uh, maybe they have <coughs> secret food sources under the water. There are still suits. Yeah. Uh, they withdraw water from their body and they could just sip on it all day. Yeah, which was just nuts. recycles it. Yeah. Um, well, they said they had thousands of those big water caches. Yeah. That that's true. All, hidden all over the place. But like, who were they? They were the people who just occupied that planet originally, I guess. Um, yeah. I think. I mean, it's it's hard to pull apart in this film. Yeah. By watching this movie without having... I mean, I read most of this book when I was in high school. 
I've forgotten most of this book since then. <laughs> but watching it now, I'm like, A, it would have made more sense to go with more like a Middle Eastern ethnicity for these sure. people because it would be more topical today. Um, even then, in the yeah. 80s, it would definitely be more topical. It would make more sense to kind of focus on this. It'd yeah. make more sense for this to be the entirety of the plot is Paul meeting these people, joining them, their fight. We have a good, I mean, what, the movie's two and a half hours long or something? It felt like four. Yeah. I feel like there's a straight hour of them, like, getting to the planet, setting all that up, yeah. doing all that. Well, there's some interesting ideas yeah. there. And, and yeah, It pa- just bogs down the whole story. Part of that is to try and build this universe. Because yeah. you are trying to build this grand scale. Let's talk about the biggest failure of the movie, in my opinion. Gaty Prime which is the planet of the Har- Harkonnens, Harkonnens, is yeah. easily the most disgusting thing we've watched on this list. <laughs> I and we've watched a Dane Cook movie. Yeah. I could have handled just the set and world design because yeah. it's supposed to be a like a stark industrial. difference from yeah, yeah. your main characters. It's industrial. It's green. It looks like a boss level out of like Mega Man or Sonic yeah. 2. It's um, like a maze of, of like yeah. industrial rooms. No problem with that. Yeah. But the first scene is your introduction to the Duke of, of Prime. Yeah. And he's like having a boil lanced or something. And His, this creepy doctor is mm-hmm. like, your skin is perfect. He's like, it's a pleasure to drain your boils. Yeah. And he's like eating or something or like chomping. Yeah. And, and then Sting shows up. <laughs> His two nephews are there. Everyone in this planet's ginger, by the way, which yeah. is an insult to gingers, among anything. So. As a ginger, yeah. <laughs> like, everyone here, it, they just look shady. People have a shaved, like, reverse mohawk. Yeah. Everyone except Sting. Um, and this dude's just like, you gotta go, like, fuck up the Atreides house. Yeah. Blah. And it's, like, very overtly homophobic. Yeah. Um, yeah, he leers at like plus. every young man he sees. They bring a young man out that has a plug in his heart. Yeah, and he unplugs it, and I think eats him. Eats slash sexually assaults him. I Probably don't know. Both. If you're being yeah, eaten, you're both. being sexually assaulted. Yeah, it's it's just gross. It adds nothing. It that's the that's the problem. Yeah. It literally adds nothing to the movie. If you're trying to say the Atreides are good, the Harkonnens are bad. You can do that in a much more mild way. That's yeah. palatable. And this was just, oh, it, it made me cringe. It made the Atreides me are the Atreides are good. They follow duty and honor, and they're smart. The Harkonnens are bad. They eat and fuck men. Yeah, like that's it. <laughs> and it's also like the the main Harkonnen. He's so obese that he has to wear a suit that carries him around the room, like an anti gravity thing. They An never Iron really Man explain suit. it. Yeah. They never really explain it. So he's just like bouncing around. <laughs> it's I, every time that popped up, I was yeah hysterically laughing that's a plot it, point it just, at one it's point so so. Yeah. yeah he got his uh, his anti-gravity suit gets popped at the yeah. end right and he falls through a spaceship or something uh, it's just I don't even know if that happened it could have happened for all I know did. I think it did I think I was awake <laughs> at that point um, now, it, sleep, you would say the sleeper has awakened I would yeah you would they but say that about 12 times in this movie wh- when they did that se- sequence on Gaty Prime I literally fully pulled out of the yeah. movie I couldn't have gotten back into it. Yeah, it was p- impossible. So then, so then they have the like siege on Arrakis, and it's all contingent on like one of the closest allies of the Atreides betraying them for like barely any reason. I don't know how that was justified. I'm sure it was. They, but- uh, it's a character played by Dean Stockwell. I think he's like their medical professional yeah. doctor type of person. Yeah. Um, basically, they've done some. The Harkonnens have done something to him. He's the Atreides doctor. They've taken his wife or done they've uh, done something okay. with his wife. Yeah. They explain it later after yeah. all the betrayal happens. Um so that happens. They set it up in the film, and I kind of this is something I kind of enjoy. Uh they set it up to make the audience think he's just betraying the Atreides. Mm-hmm. Afterwards you realize he has to betray them. Yeah. But he's set up certain fail safes. So he gives uh daddy, he gives him a uh, poison tooth um yeah. that he's supposed to use, and then he gives a stockpile of uh of weapons and suits and stuff to yeah. uh, Paul and his mom. Yeah. So like it's a double betrayal basically, which I like I like that idea. I yeah. like that it throws you for a loop. It's not really executed well here cuz you don't understand it until it's all too late. Yeah. Also think about Daddy Atreides there. He got stabbed by one of his closest confidants. Then the confidant's like, "This is a poison tooth. If you chew on it and then exhale, you'll kill him." And then he had to pull one of his teeth to put it in. That yeah. would suck. Yeah. 
So, I mean, it's... Yeah. Guys, this it's just one of those things. You see why this movie's a failure just by watching it. Yeah. There's a lot. A we could go mess. on a lot. I mean, yeah. the female characters are weak at best. Um, like we said, there's a lot of homophobia. There's just a lot of gross scenes for the sake of being gross. Sting was useless. The The most important thing Sting does is he wears a metal bikini bottom at one point. Yeah. And that's because the producers freaked out at the last second and decided they didn't want him naked. He was originally going to be nude and he was cool with it. Um of course he was. He sting. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that scene's really weird. He's just this in a giant like steam bath and yeah. walks out in metal underwear. And he's and like, his uncle I'll just take like care watches of him. This. <laughs> yeah. It's. I mean, there's so much. It's all so with this. odd. And those are basic story points. And it lost itself in the details so far that it failed to tell yeah. a coherent story. So, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off this to talk about to jump way back to my what I've been watching in preparation for this film. I watched a little documentary called Hodorowsky's Dune, yep. and it's about the uh, the filmmaker. I think Alejandro Hodorowsky is his name. He's in a lot of iconic cult films that most people have not heard of, like El Topo. Um, okay. And there, there's a lot. I mean, I could go on about that, but he's a very avant-garde director. I believe he's Chilean and French, but he got his start in Mexican cinema. Okay. He's an actor-director. He was actually one of the filmmakers slated to make Dune before... David Lynch got on board. This documentary I watched is amazing. One of my favorite documentaries I've watched in a while because this guy is knuckin' futz. <laughs> um, he's definitely an artist. He actually has a lot of respect for David Lynch. Um, and he assembled a lot of people, including uh, the artist Mobius, who is a French comic artist who's been very influential. I want to say he might have some involvement with a Valerian, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Actually, he might not. But he's okay. had a lot of involvement with like French comics. Sure. Um, then you had uh, H.R. Giger, who went on to create the Alien yeah, design, yeah. as well as David O'Bannon was involved, who also went on to create Alien. He was the other guy with Ridley Scott. Um, okay. And you had a lot of crew that kind of that were assembled for this movie. Uh, Chris Foss is one. He did um, some Starship design, I think, in Guardians of the Galaxy. Wow. Uh, and he's done like a lot of Taylor, you know, Chris Foss. We, we've looked at his work before. but uh, Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of like talent involved and they made this giant book of uh of dune like all storyboarded out that's where the script existed he assembled like this in- insane crew pink floyd was going to do all the music for atreides this other metal band was going to do all the music for harkonnen that's really it's, cool there's just like levels and levels um david carradine was going to play uh leto atreides daddy atreides and then wow uh, uh this guy's son was going to play paul it was insane, um, all of his ideas. Part of he wanted to end his movie with uh Paul getting killed, but then Paul's uh Messiah personality getting like emanated like disseminated into all the people there, so they all start chanting, I am Paul, I am Paul. His idea was gonna be like a six hour movie. Um Is that something that actually happens in the Dune novels? No. Oh. Neither how this one ended, the David Lynch one, nor this one. Um I will say like this Hodorowsky guy was was he's he's weird. He's definitely like an artist who wants to do his own things. He yeah. basically said like he doesn't care if he takes the source work and does what he wants with it. That's just what he's going to do. Like the book is something, the film is yeah. something else. The way he got this idea after his his movies were successful, um his art house films, they were like what do you want to do? And he just remembered out of the blue, I think he was high. He had never read Dune, and him and a friend, like a friend explained the entire story of Dune to him while they were like high or something, and he was like that's what I want to do. I want to make amazing. that movie. So he did his idea off of someone's retelling, and that's what he created his Dune from. Uh, the movie eventually, once they showed like their working document yeah. to studios in Hollywood, they were like, no, absolutely not. Yeah, so it never got to filming. Never got to filming. And um, it, it never really got past concept? Never got past concept, okay. but they distributed all these books, these Dune books around. Mm. Um, and then they said stuff like, you know, Star Wars shows up later with a lot of similar ship design, a lot of similar... Um, battle design from the uh like okay. he they were from showing the panels of like sto- sword fights and stuff and yeah. if you line it up with the, the lightsabers it's like identical and then Interesting. i mean dan o'bannon openly went to create alien with hr geiger um yeah. geiger some of the uh designs in prometheus and alien are like yeah, the whole universe like there. their harkonnen uh building looks exactly like that weird circle mountain thing in prometheus so it's yeah. like all these things just got like kind of distributed. And so he's like re-influenced cinema in a way that people don't understand. And my movie will never get made. But now he's also like, I mean, people should just 
one day they can animate my idea, so maybe it can still get made because animation's that good. It's definitely worth checking it's, out. It definitely sounds nuts. Yeah. Um, um, I say if you've seen Dune and you're like, yeah, that movie kind of sucks, watch this guy. Uh, watch his documentary. Where can we find it? Uh, it's airing free on Crackle right now. There it um, is. I don't like Crackle. It this is brought to you by Crackle. It's a very cumbersome streaming service. Maybe so. a Joe Dirt Too Beautiful Loser and yeah. Jodorowsky's Dune. Do a little double, double. feature. Oh. So. <laughs> but basically, I wanted to watch it because... I mean, Dune itself, everyone knows it as like being an influential story. Not everyone's read it. Everyone yeah. knows this is a failure as a film. Sci-Fi Channel did their own like miniseries version. They did. Um, and I, I own that, actually. Think, and this, Scott, this was back when, this was early 2000s. This may have been yeah, 02 or 03. I think. Okay. The and sequel, uh, they, they made a follow-up ser- series with James McAvoy, by the way. Hey. And that, that one I have not seen. I yeah. kind of want to. Do you own now, the my, original because you really like it? Was it? Let's say yes. Now, <laughs> I own the um, I own the uh, the miniseries because after years of insistence of my father making sure he wants you know he wants me to make sure I read all, a lot of the same stuff he likes, and he loves Frank Herbert. He's read the first three books, I think, and um, he was like, "This is a- extremely faithful to the source." Okay. But in order to do so, they had to make a miniseries where I, I want to say it's at least six hours long. I want to say it was week long. That makes and, sense. I um, think it was. And it's it's good. It fleshes out a lot of details, except it's on a TV show's budget. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of the things. A lot of CG. Yeah, a lot of Early not good CG, CG, except yeah. it's extremely colorful. This uh, David Lynch's version's very black and dark, except yeah, for muted. a few set pieces. Yeah. Yeah. This one is very bright and beautiful, and I like it quite a bit. I really do. It's got uh, the biggest name in it is William Hurt. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah. it's. It's Does got it William Hurt as Leto Atreides. Daddy Atreides. And it and it's got um Scott, did you ever see Ace Ventura 2 when Nature Calls? I have. Okay. Not. Do you know the guy Cadby, the uh the big fat dude that uh Ace Ventura is following around? I haven't seen it. The sweaty Oh, I thought you said you did. Oh shit. I did it um, in a tricky way. Yeah. Yeah, you did. I have <laughs> um he deemed the, dude that they, the dude that they got to play um Baron Harkonnen is naturally big and fat, and he he sort of chews the scenery nowhere near this guy in the '84 Dune. But he um he the was only big thing and fat. I was gross. chewing. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was just I I like it a lot, but because it it has no narration, it has no that's a win. internal monologue. Yeah. What do you guys think about this uh, this new reboot they're doing? Yeah, I was going to bring that up, but I did want to say what? I can see how a series makes more sense yeah. for Dune because you get like six to ten hours to flesh out characters and ideas and mm-hmm. stuff, whereas with a movie, you have to bounce along pretty quick. Nowadays, you can do maybe like a pushing three movie, yeah. but back in the 80s, I mean, you, had to, you really had to make it good to get two and a half. Yeah, and, I mean, to... When I see a movie that's three hours long, I got to be ready to watch it. Yeah. Like, it took me two tries to watch JFK, and in the end, I liked it, but you, a three-hour investment, it's still pretty crazy. Yep. Like, to imagine a six-hour Dune, I want to cry. But, yeah, so let's talk about the reboot, which has been announced, mm-hmm. and I don't think any casting or anything has been no. done yet, but uh, Denis Villeneuve who has directed Prisoners, Arrival, the upcoming Blade Runner 2049, Sicario, Enemy, all sorts of stuff. He's knocked pretty much everything he's done out of the park. And so they said, hey, give Dune a go. Yeah, let's knock him down a notch. Yeah. Nah. Um, only he, if it makes it into two movies. That's the only way it's going to work. Well, I was going to ask what you would think would make it work. So would you take this story? I mean, this story is probably at least close to the book. Yeah, and break it off at the like the siege of Arrakis when he gets abandoned out in with, the spice. Or? But this film, the '84 one, I yeah. thought that was the most interesting part of the movie. However, I don't know with a reboot. I mean, no. with this, with you, you got a guy who knows how to make a good film. He's probably like yeah. from the modern set of directors, one of the more talented ones with like a distinct voice in his filmmaking. Definitely. Um. So I mean. 
it's almost like an analog to David Lynch in that sense, where you yep. have somebody with a very yeah. distinct voice. So it's kind of I don't know if you're going for if you're going for two hours, truncate it, either beginning it like the beginning parts, yeah. or the second parts. Um, yeah, I feel like if you need to cut it down, you can kind of start on Arrakis yeah. and just say like, yeah, operations have been running, and yeah. now the Harkon- Harkonnens are going to come in. Mm-hmm. You can kind of do that. Then start you lose with some yeah, of the Atreides like arriving, background. But yeah. 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 Um, after I would say that you definitely need to stop it at when Paul becomes self-aware and fully becomes Muad'Dib. Yeah. Like, if you stopped the movie right there with him awakening, like, let's say the last shot of the movie was him awakening from his life water coma with bright blue spice eyes. Yeah. That would make an interesting shot. And then the next one could take place and you could have some exposition about how they've been fighting for two years and yeah. you could do yeah. a lot of other I mean, things. I don't know if any that. of this is in the book. Let us let me go ahead and say this right now. I don't know if any of this is in the book. I, I don't really care, but I just think that if you, like, I think you could make it into two movies if you stopped it at the right part. Yeah. yeah and, and I don't think you should put the cart before the horse with a property that will be a challenge to adapt. You don't want to already start with two movies and stuff. Yeah. But it's really hard when my only experience with Dune is this movie. It's hard to yeah. picture any way that it could work, even when you put my favorite modern director <laughs> yeah. at the helm. Like I say, you'd be showing up for him more yeah. than Dune. Oh, easily. Because yeah. Arrival what? touched me on such a crazy level. It's yeah. so good. I would I would like to see definitely like a more diverse casting within the, the story. Yeah. Like oh, like absolutely. Riz Riz Ahmed would be a cool Paul. Hell yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I don't know, just just bring in some of these new talents we have coming up and kind of stray yeah. away from how they went with this one, you know? Like no, just try something no. new. You well, give this me one, Kyle MacLachlan it, this as one was Duke good. Atreides. <laughs> yeah, that Hell would yeah. be cool. This um, one didn't have like huge it's not like Al Pacino was No, no, you're right. You're right. But it's it's So now that we're talking about that <laughs> Can we do Al Pacino as, like, Duke Harkonnen? Yeah. Or he could be uh, the emperor of the known universe. Yeah. Um, but, no, I mean, you know, this one, it definitely feels like a little bit of European theater mixed with, yeah. I don't know, just, like, up-and-comers. Um, so it's an interesting it's bag odd. for 84. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, there's ways you can make it work, I think. Yeah. I think with the right talent and a commitment to a vision, you can make anything work. Yeah. But if you're building it off of the David Lynch one, I don't see that path. Yeah. The only now, thing in my mind that works for the Dune reboot is to the tune of Dune, our musical that we're about to write. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm in. I'm, I'm in, in that. too. Get I mean, Damien Chazelle on the phone. This would also be a great <laughs> property to bring back the Spice Girls. Have oh, them do a little boy. feature song. <laughs> I'm in. Um <laughs> Real quick, just kind of our, our talk of reboots and series and movies, uh, sure. kind of an analog to this. Uh, they just announced this week that uh, Watchmen's going to get an HBO series yes, uh, right. head by uh, Damon Lindelof. I, I don't want that to happen. And I know I'm stepping on your toes here, Scott, because of your, uh, your, Lin- your Lindelof lost love here. But I don't, <laughs> There's no I lo- don't want to see lost that. There. So, um, it, I'm pretty excited for it. Lindelof Honestly. just wrapped up The Leftovers, which I'm still in season one, but by all accounts has been excellent. Yeah. Lost gets its mixed reviews because, and it deserves some mixed reviews, even though I'm a big fan. But Damon Lindelof's done some bad stuff too. I'm not I'm not that sure if I'm all that interested in revisiting the Watchmen world. I'm a huge <sighs> critic of Zack Snyder, but I thought the Watchmen movie was fine. Like, I don't watch the Watchmen and think hey, there's a much better version of this out there. This seemed like a good version of it. So you I don't know, know if I want to That's just a big series. question of who See, watches for, the Watchmen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, this would this would be my Dune. Um, I love the Watchmen comic, and I think it's, no. it's definitely one of the most influential comics of its time. And for sure. I would love like a faithful adaptation. That being said, I don't know if it'll be it, but I'm pretty excited no. to see what comes out of it. With the, the way budgets are now and HBO is looking for a new... Yeah. A, a new Game of Thrones that's not Westworld, basically. Yeah, they're definitely... <laughs> there's a gap to fill there yeah. for their prestige show, really. I think Westworld's really good, but I don't know if it's Game of Thrones big. It's not 
nearly Game of Thrones. It, it was a slow burn to build up the audience, yeah. but the budget is huge. And it's internet popular. Yeah, yeah so that, that one's its own beast almost altogether. Yeah. I don't think they're going to get seven seasons out of Westworld. No. I think it'll be maybe two, yeah. maybe three. Yeah. That's fine. We'll see. Watchmen doesn't I necessarily that, need multiple seasons, but you can do a lot with it, basically. No. So I think that shows that already have their end in mind can pace themselves a lot better. For sure. If you know that you're making a three-season show, a four-season show, you can really work towards the end and have less... Now, the theory is you'd have less plot holes and less yeah. Yeah. crap bogging you down, but I... Th- don't get me wrong. If they make a Watchmen TV show, I'm going to watch it straight up. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I'm going to check it out. Yeah. But I love, I love the movie version quite a bit. Um, Max actually turned me on to the comic in uh, 2004. I think it was right after I graduated high school. It, and I love it. I thoroughly love it. And I, I bought the ultimate director's cut of um, Watchmen, the one that has uh, the, the Curse of the Black Freighter, um, yeah. re edit it into that and it's I enjoy the movie except it has flaws because it's a Zack Snyder movie he's not allowed to make a good movie but Whoa. Jackie Earl, Jackie Earl Haley and uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan are the two most perfect people in this movie absolutely they are for me uh, with the Watchmen movie the main thing that was lost in translation was the Watchmen comic has about I would say four to five nested stories going on at the same time and the mm-hmm. movie can't capture that i think it's a challenge for any movie to capture that yeah yeah like any book or anything that yeah. has so many nested stories because it's really hard to make it coherent visually yeah yeah so how the series handles that i don't know but it'll be interesting yeah. we'll sure. see i'm actually kind of eager to revisit the movie it's been a little while since i've watched it and i'd like to yeah give it another go now, one thing we no. won't be revisiting anytime soon is Dune. Yeah, I'm no. done with this. <laughs> well, I guess until your boy makes until, his version. Until Denny gets yeah. in there. We could do a follow-up episode then. Sure. I'm sure we'll still be Max, going. Can you imagine a young Kyle MacLachlan from this movie? I'm trying to think if I have any more final thoughts about this movie. I like young Kyle MacLachlan. Patrick Stewart with a skullet is great. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, th- that pug, that pug was definitely deserving the pug of was the highlight of the spot. Movie. Yeah, yeah. Virginia um, Madsen I, has a pretty face. That's all I got. Yeah. And so does Francesca I, Anise. Yeah, she was the highlight, maybe. Yeah. Other than the pug. The, uh, I liked her there's hair. There's the scene. Good hair. God, there's a scene where they're walking through the desert, and it's one of Lynch's, one of Lynch's stylistic shots of how he has people walking through, like just the natural way the sand flows and cracks and moves beneath them as they walk was really good. But those are just parts of a whole. Like it's yeah. not. Oh yeah. Not some of the good. some of those shots of like the dunes from far away, like when they were doing his drinking of the water of life, they had like this really far away shot of them like walking out to him. I thought that was pretty yeah. cool. There was there was good shots. Now for visual composition, I mean, yeah. we didn't even mention it really, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. There's just there's you're too distracted too. by everything else to yeah. really notice it. There's some yeah. cool close up shots. There's some cool. Yeah. Cuts. I, mean, I mean there's cool yeah. things in here yeah. I so this movie is weird and Jupiter Ascending is weird Jupiter Ascending is weird in so much less offensive of a way that <laughs> I'd rather rewatch Jupiter Ascending I think I wow. would wow yeah I think I would too honestly yeah, I mean you have weird Channing Tatum you have bees you, you could trust bees or bees, bees don't lie yeah, bees don't lie that they stuff's don't. more palatable than everything that happened with the Harkonnens yeah <laughs> so now I will say I, I thought about this uh, when the it shows an op- like a close up of the open worm's mouth. Yeah, I got a very sarlacc uh, pit, the pit of carcoon feel about mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I did. And I, I realized that's did. because that guy Kit West freaking worked oh, on yeah. both movies. <laughs> there you go. He's like, no one's seen Dune. Or this, did which, this come out after or before Return of the Jedi? This would have been after. Yeah. Um, uh, which once again ties back to Hodorowski's Dune influencing Star Wars in its own way. So it all it's all for for all cir- full circle. I believe that's our for third sure. bringer back. Third bringer back. Well, let's uh, let's bring her back to our uh, our closing lines oh. here. Max, where can the good people find us? Um, you can find us folding space, or at thecriticalbreakdown.com. You can find me doing extremely weird close-ups with Virginia Madsen, or you can just find me on Twitter at Max Rivera Film. You can find me being prepped as a meal for a Harkonnen Duke 
Or you can find me at breakdown underscore Scott on Instagram. Still got it. <laughs> you can find me in the uh, mouse shaped shadow of the moon. Or you can find me uh, on Twitter as Taylor R. Phillips. Uh, head over to our, our Facebook, our website, thecriticalbreakdown.com. Uh, shoot us an email at uh, thecriticalbreakdownpodcast at gmail.com. You thought Dune was fine. Yeah. Tell us why. Yeah. I, I want to know. You uh, you love the book, hate the movie? Let us know. Let us love know the what movie, they did hate wrong. the book. I want to know everyone's thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store or, you know, whatever the hell you want to review us on. Just do it. Um, Jason Brown did our music. Uh, Josh Rivera did our art. And uh, Walter is the podcast dog. The spice must flow. Next week on The Critical Breakdown, we're going to get real medieval and watch A Knight's Tale. Rated 58% on Rotten Tomatoes. Saddle up. <laughs>